Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission podcast, and we want to hear your true and scariest work stories. So send them to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. We'll even pay you five cents per word if we end up narrating your story on the show. But you have to have a working PayPal, and your story must be scary and believable. Thank you. Now, go rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts before I overdose on coffee. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? I drive by forests on my way to work every day. They're nice, pleasant even, but catch the woods on a fall night and that pleasantness is gone. Funny how a tree can be serene or ominous depending on the season. The lack of leaves turns it into something sinister. That reminds me of something. I know you're excited about our pumpkin lice latte is coming back next month, but that's not why I'm bringing up the seasons. No, it's about the trees. The first story I've got to share with you today is one of the creepiest I've heard, and it makes me glad I'm no lumberjack. And it's just one of several new tales I've got for you that might chill you to your very bones. Hold on to your apron. These are tales from the break room. The Chainsaw Masked Its Footsteps From Neurotica Rampage this story happened back in the year of 2012. I was working as what best could be described as a lumberjack, up in the mountains, many miles from anything that could be remotely described as civilization. My crew had been hired by the government to clear trails and cut fire breaks. For anyone who doesn't know, a fire break is basically clearing the forest floor of dead debris, so that if a fire does start out from a lightning strike or a careless scamper, then the fire has a tougher time jumping between trees. Anyway, my crew and I had left the closest town, which was about two hours away, at 6 a.m. A couple of hours later, we arrived at the job site. It was a crisp late spring morning, made even more crisp by the altitude of the mountain we'd found ourselves on. We were a crew of eight, four running chainsaws, four dragging limps. After we checked our saws and fueled them up, we started walking through the woods, where we'd left off the day before. The morning passed us by at a brisk pace. We'd been there for almost two months by then, and the finish line was in sight. We were all pushing ourselves to get this done so we could move on to the next job. That and the government contract we had was slowly ticking closer to the deadline. By midday, we'd all kind of wandered off on our own paths, hitting the various spots that we might have overlooked the first time around, just doing a final cleanup of the particular area. By then, we were so far away from one another, the last time I'd seen another crewmate had been an hour or so. The only indication that there was even anybody out there with me was the faint screaming of chainsaws off in the distance. I'd stopped for a moment in a small patch of trees and brush and was cutting up some of the deadfall, after about five minutes, I stopped my chainsaw, standing there for a moment. Something felt off. It's really hard to explain all this time later. It would have been almost as hard to explain then, to be honest. But unless you've been in the situation yourself, it's just difficult to express the feeling you get when there's something inside of you screaming, you are in danger. It's a primal feeling built into us. And even though we live in a day and age where it's not so often needed, it's still there, still inside all of us. So I stopped and whirled around. But I saw nothing. Just aspens and pines swaying in the breeze. I stood there and collected myself for a few minutes until my heavy breathing subsided. Then I heard a voice coming from the top of a hill that made me jump. Hey, come on. come on, it's time for, it's lunch. Time for lunch. My boss stood at the crest of the hill, waving at me. I sat my chainsaw next to an old tree stump, so I didn't have to lug it all the way back with me. I then made my way up the hill. On the way back to the truck, my boss and I made some small talk. I was watching you for a minute or two down there, he said. The saw acted like it was running all right. Did you run out of gas when you stopped, or was there an issue? No, I said, 
No issue, just giving it a rest for a minute. Good, he spoke, slightly relieved. I'd be pretty mad if I spent all that money getting it fixed, just so it could break on us all the way out here. Nope, running like a dream, I said back. Fifteen minutes later, and we were all back at the truck, eating and talking, just having a pretty decent day in general. The crew I was with was a really great group of guys, and we all liked one another, which definitely made the jobs go by easier. After my decadent lunch of Vienna sausages, potato chips, and water, I grabbed a small gas can to refuel my saw, and a few tools for maintenance. I then started making my way back towards where I left off. Wait up! Wait up. My boss walked over, packing a saw. Hey, uh, I'll walk with you down there. I need to walk the boundary and make sure we went far enough. Yeah, sure. You just want to ruin my after-lunch nap, I said, jokingly. Oh, glad to know I'm not the only one that does that. Now I don't feel so lazy, he joked back. After another 15 minutes, we were back down the hill heading towards the grouping of trees where I'd left off. There we were, both met with quite the sight. On the ground, at the exact spot I left my saw, was nothing but several miscellaneous pieces of it. My boss rushed over to the spot to investigate. I was quick on his heels. He was cursing the whole way there. He could get very creative with his cursing when the occasion called for it. What kind of darned fool, he said, before he got quiet for a moment and looked at me. You were here. You saw where I left it. When we walked away for lunch, you know it wasn't me, I said. I know, I know, he said, shaking his head. I just, I just don't understand why. Heck, just steal the dang thing. Why would they go through this trouble to destroy it? He sat there for a few more moments in disbelief before turning to talk to me again. Well, I guess now I gotta go get a hold of the cops. He turned back to look at the mess or whoever's going to come all the way up here. Keep on cutting. Don't let this one out of your sight. My boss handed over his chainsaw to me. He then turned around and started to walk at a brisk pace back towards the truck. At this point, I was unnerved, to say the least. Between the feeling that came over me earlier, and now this vandalism of my chainsaw, I didn't exactly want to be out here by myself any longer. After a minute of once again getting my nerves under control, I grabbed all my supplies and I walked to the next area. I started to cut. Only about 150 yards away, I came across another small spot we'd missed, so I got back to it. For the next hour or so I worked, cutting up limbs and picking up broken branches off the ground, stacking them into neat piles away from the trunks of any trees. My saw ran out of gas once again, and I put it down. At this point, the creeping dread started crawling up my spine again. The silence in that forest was deafening once the saw was shut down. I had acute awareness of every single tiny noise, or the lack thereof, and it made me shiver. I felt a presence all too close to me, and I froze in place. After building up my courage, I spun around to see, still nothing. I sat down, fueling up the chainsaw. I wiped my face with a rag that I had in my back pocket. I'm losing it, I thought. But at the same time, the memory of the broken chainsaw seemed to linger, a reminder telling me that, no, I was not losing it. There was something out here with me. I let out another heavy exhale, and decided that I'd run one more fuel tank through my saw, and by that time it should be close enough to the end of the day that I can just head back to the truck. After readying my things, I looked around. I found this tiny dead pine, needles all yellowed and browned, sitting in a stand of three trees. To explain how these were standing, there were three aspen in a tiny grouping like a triangle. The dead pine was standing in the middle, at roughly four feet tall, there weren't any trees or debris for 20 feet around that grouping. I fired up the chainsaw again, 
and I went to work, cutting down the pine tree. A few moments later, it was cut in half, and the stump was cut flush to the ground. That should work, I thought. I walked backwards a few steps, so I could look at the bigger picture and see if there was anything else I needed to do. But then, I stopped dead in my tracks when my back pressed against something solid, and my body immediately went cold. I dashed forward, whipping around and holding the shut-down chainsaw between me and whatever had just snuck up behind me. My heart pounded, eyes wide. I examined the looming figure that stood over me. It was a giant looming figure, imposing yet unnaturally skinny. My head only reached its waist, and its eyes were big, spinning with anger. Two large hands reached out to me. In the dimming light of the day, it looked like this thing had a set of wild horns sprouting out in all directions from its head. I yelped as I wheeled backwards. I stood there, paralyzed then, my brain starting to reconcile exactly what I was seeing. It was a tree, wasn't it? To be honest, as I gazed at the thing, even after I realized what it was, my brain couldn't figure out what I was seeing. Because it had bark, it seemed to be rooted in the earth, and its branches gently swayed in the wind. But there was a not-so-insignificant part of my mind that kept screaming, Run! For the love of God, run! I closed my eyes for a moment, breathing slowly, and I opened them again. I'm seeing things, I spoke aloud. That's it. It's been a long day and my nerves are shot. I took a step forward to inspect this dead tree. It indeed shared the shape of a humanoid figure even down to minor details. Its eyes that had been spinning in anger were two knots that were slightly different in diameter, spaced like they would be on a person. The mouth was a fist-sized hollowed-out hole that was just a black void in the fading light. The wild horns were branches, and two branches of the same size reached for me like long bony arms. The weirdest part of this was that it wasn't one trunk. It was two roots the size of skinny legs sprouting up from the ground and merged up at the middle of my chest. I'd seen trees like that before, but never any that merged that high above the ground. I stood there, trembling, trying to get my breathing under control. My mind kept switching rapidly between this being a monster or a simple malformed tree. I calmed down a bit after a few moments. I gave a nervous chuckle. It's just a tree. Calm down. I finally collected my nerves and said, You still got a job to do and this tree is dead. This is what you get for scaring me, you stupid tree. I ripped the pull cord on my chainsaw and it screamed to life. I took a step forward and right at the time I was maneuvering my saw to sink it deep into one of the tree's roots, I caught movement off to the left. Snapping my head in that direction, I saw my boss trudging through the woods and what I can assume were forest rangers following behind him. I pushed the kill switch on my saw, standing there taking a deep breath. Everything was out to scare me today, apparently. My boss waved me over to him. Hey, hey come walk with, come walk with us. us. Tell these guys Tell what guys happened to your chainsaw. your chainsaw. I did as I was told walking with them to the spot our equipment had been destroyed. I packed my saw with me this time. They wrote down our names, numbers, heard our version of events, and they took pictures. Soon they were off to check some of the roads for any other vehicles that might be up there. They never did find anybody that did this. Well, it's getting late, said my boss. Go on and grab your fuel can and your tools. I'll pack your saw and meet you back at the truck. I nodded, and I went back to get my things, which I'd left near the group of Aspen. My unease was slowly creeping back, even though I'd made up my mind I was alright. I spotted the red fuel can in the distance, and right then, I stopped in my tracks. I immediately felt sick to my stomach. Where did the tree go? I said aloud. 
although I might as well had been whispering, because I could barely breathe. Once I forced my legs to work, I ran over and scooped up my tools and fuel can. I broke out into a dead sprint back to the truck, and I never looked behind me. After that day, our whole crew wasn't needed up there to finish up, so I never went back. I was very grateful for that. Pareidolia. That's the psychological effect of seeing faces and patterns and random objects. That was the explanation other people would propose when I shared my story with them. Others would tell me that maybe I should go get checked for schizophrenia. And maybe I should. But I feel it. In the recesses of my mind, I know what I saw, even though I try to forget. If I didn't try, I would never even be able to continue with my job. And maybe I am crazy. It was all in my head. But what I heard later would cement the fear into my mind. Months later, the Forest Service went up to that job site to have a controlled burn of the piles we'd made. A member of their crew disappeared. Some explain it away. He had just gotten lost, they'd say but I've talked to people who are on that crew. The guy was not new. Everyone who knew him said that none of them could imagine that ever happening to him. The search for him ended suddenly too, and there was something really disturbing about the whole thing. Everyone agreed, especially me. I'm not sure why that thing took him and let me go. The only reason I can come up with is that when my boss and those rangers topped that hill, that thing saw them and froze. I'll probably never know why, but I know what I saw, and I know there's something out there in those woods. Room with the Red Door From Lavreau R. This story happened to me two years ago. I had just finished high school, and my parents insisted I go to college. I spent the whole summer looking for a suitable college, but didn't find one. Under the pressure of my parents, I enrolled in a random college in a city near my town. As I expected, I didn't find it appealing, and soon after I dropped out. Understandably, my parents were angry with me, telling me that either I go to college or I get a temporary job. My friend, Leonard, with whom I was really close, enrolled in a college that was far from our home city. Logically, with him deeply involved in his studies, we started to talk less. With Leonard gone and my parents constantly breathing down my neck, I decided to get a job. I didn't really know where to start, but my mother knew a family friend called Miles, who had a company called Certus Surveillances. It's a small company that primarily deals with the installation of video surveillance at various places. As a big tech nerd, I instantly got interested in that. I had my mom call him the very next day. Honestly, I didn't expect much. But surprisingly, the next day, my mother said that she managed to get me an interview with Miles. Miles used to live in my town, but eventually he moved to the city nearby. For business, I guess. A few days passed and I drove myself to his house. It was a short ride, maybe 30 minutes, and when I arrived, he was already waiting for me in front of his house. As I was parking, I noticed a video camera on every corner of the place. A little bit ironic, I thought. I got out of my car and he invited me into the house. Miles was a very talkative person, which can't be said for me. I'm more of an introvert and rarely speak a lot. Personally, I love just hearing people's stories. Miles' house was pretty big, and you could easily get lost in it. So naturally, I stayed close to him, and he led me into his office. He told me to sit down and wait for him, because he had to get some papers for me to sign. His office looked very organized, clean, and it had a lot of pictures of his family members. But what really got my attention was the red door behind his desk, Naturally, I was a bit curious, but I tried not to think about it. At the moment, Miles and his wife, Rebecca, entered the room. Rebecca handed me the paperwork, then left. 
Miles said that he talked to my mother about me leaving college. Oh God, more judgment, I thought. But surprisingly, Miles was understanding. He explained to me that he too dropped out of college. He said he completely understood. People sometimes don't know what they want. He asked me a little bit about my previous job experience, which I didn't really have. I've worked at a local supermarket, but that was only for one summer. After our conversation, he said to me that the only thing left was for me to sign the papers, and I could start work tomorrow. That was easy, I thought, as I took the papers and signed. One last thing, he added. You see that door behind me? Under no circumstances are you allowed to enter that room. Not even peek through the keyhole. You got it? I was a bit confused, but I quickly agreed. I got home pretty late that night. I was really tired. I took a quick shower and laid down in bed. Despite my exhaustion, I couldn't fall asleep very easily. I started wondering about that red door and the room behind it. I mean, what could be in there that he doesn't want me to see? A lot of money? After a long while, sleep overtook me. The next few weeks were pretty normal. I would come to his house at 7am and he would drive us to our job locations with his little van. On the road to our job locations, we would have some time to talk. In the beginning, it was a little awkward because I didn't know what to talk about with him. He would bring up sports, but I didn't like sports. He would also offer me his chocolate from time to time. You see, Miles was diabetic, so he could only eat sugar-free chocolate. And surprisingly, I enjoyed it. I soon even preferred it over a normal one. At one point, I was wondering, so I asked him why he named his company Certus Surveillances. And he explained to me that Certus means safe, that he wants to send people a message that with his video surveillance systems, they'll be safe. My tasks when we arrived at the job were pretty simple. I would carry the tools, the cables, and other gadgets for miles. Also, I assisted him when he was installing the cameras. After the installation, I would pick up the stuff, and we'd be done. It's not the hardest job out there. Every day after work, we would come to his office, so I could pick up my stuff and go home. And every day, I would stare at that red door. My interest in it grew. A couple of months passed and nothing really happened. But then one day after work, Miles led me into his office, and just as we entered it, his wife called him downstairs. He left me alone in his office. I began picking up my things to leave, but then I got a strange feeling. I don't know how to explain it, but I got chills all over my body. I felt as if I was being drawn to that red door, like someone or something wanted me to open it. I let go of my stuff and walked over to the door. This time, I put my ear on the door, trying to hear movement inside. I knew I didn't have much time before Miles parked the van and came back to the office, so I was ready to let it go and leave when I felt air on my cheek coming out of the keyhole. Did he leave a window open in there? I thought. I took my ear off the door and decided to peek again. That was a decision I would regret for the rest of my life. Just as I looked through the keyhole, I saw a set of snow-white teeth smiling at me. I froze for a moment. I was so shocked, so terrified, I just couldn't move. Then I felt a rush of adrenaline. My heart started beating so fast I was sure it would pop out of my chest. I took my things and I ran as fast as I could. I nearly fell down the stairs as I ran down from the office. I was so creeped out, I didn't even say goodbye to Miles. When I got home, I felt like I was going to throw up and just couldn't stop shaking. It took me some time to calm down, but I couldn't stop thinking about what I saw through that keyhole. Was that really a person in there? Or maybe something else? I wondered. The next day, I didn't go to work. I called Miles and said I had the flu. Until that moment, in my eyes, Miles was a great boss and a good friend. But now I was starting to wonder, did he have some sort of dark secret? Eventually, when I came back to work, I decided to ask him more about the room behind the red door. 
I began the conversation with comments about his office, how I liked his organization, and I liked the pictures of his family on the wall. He didn't seem annoyed at my questions, so I continued with them. So, uh, that red door, was it there when you bought the house, or? As soon as I asked that, his smile disappeared. He looked at me dead serious and told me, We don't talk about that room, kid. I just looked down at my coffee and didn't say a word. The rest of the day was pretty uneventful. I got home a little earlier, so I decided to look into Miles. I couldn't find much about him. He seemed like a normal guy, nothing criminal, nothing shady. After that, I started looking for missing person reports in the area. I was thinking maybe he kidnapped somebody, but eventually I gave up, because I couldn't find anything. A couple of days passed and nothing really happened, until one day. Miles and I drove up to his home and he got a call. It was his son's trainer. His son had apparently broke his hand at football training and needed Miles to drive him to the hospital. Miles quickly explained the situation to me, saying, You know where the keys are, okay? After he left, I knew this was my one and only chance to find out what was happening behind that red door. I entered his office, carefully approaching the red door. Then I slowly started to open it, only to realize it was locked. I should have known, I thought. I spent a good ten minutes finding the key, but long story short, it was in the bottom drawer of his desk. After I unlocked the door, I tried opening it again. And it opened. As I entered the room, it was dimly lit, so I couldn't see much. So I turned the flashlight on my phone on. I started to look around the room. I saw a bunch of weird-looking symbols first. I didn't recognize any of them. They looked ancient. In the middle of the room was a stand with some kind of book. I came closer to it, starting to read it. Like the symbols, I couldn't understand a thing. So I put the book down... But then I saw something behind the book stand. A bowl. I picked it up and noticed it was full of some kind of red fluid. At first I was confused until I realized the bowl I was now holding in my hands was full of blood. My legs started to shake and my heart began to beat very fast. Slowly I put the bowl back down and as I turned... I noticed a big pentagram drawn with blood on the wall next to me. At that moment, the red door through which I had entered the room suddenly closed. I quickly rushed to it and tried to open it, but I couldn't. It felt like somebody locked them up. I started to panic, hyperventilating. I even thought about calling the police. Then I felt it again. That strange feeling I felt when I first saw those white teeth. I turned my back and looked behind me. There it was, a strange shadowy figure in the corner of the room. As I looked at it, it smiled at me with those white teeth. I just froze. I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was going to pass out. I was so scared I began to hit the door, trying to get it open. As that dark figure began to approach me, I hit the door so hard it finally gave. I quickly shut the door behind me, locking it again with the key. I was covered in sweat. I couldn't believe what I saw. Was that a demon? What about the blood? The book? The freaking pentagram on the wall? Some kind of demon ritual? I put the key back in the drawer where I found it, and I quickly left Miles' house. When I made it back home, I was still trembling. At that moment, I heard my phone ringing. It was Miles. Maybe he noticed I was in the room, I thought. Hey, kid. You left your jacket in my office. I sighed with relief. Thanks, Miles. I'll pick it up tomorrow, I told him. As I hung up the phone, I felt instantly better. But now I was left with a new problem. I didn't know what to do. I thought about calling the police or just telling someone, but... Eventually, I stayed quiet. I thought people wouldn't believe me, that they would call me crazy. I worked with Miles another month, then I left. 
I spent my summer after that catching up with Leonard, and I even told him this story. But obviously, he had his doubts about it. I don't know what I saw that day, or what's even going on in that room, but one thing is sure. I'll never forget those snow-white teeth. 911 for Watt City From Jed Sotopop Up until recently, I worked at the 911 dispatch center in my city. The center serviced the city as well as surrounding rural areas, and encompassed dispatch for police, fire, and ambulance services. On an average night, a communications officer would handle about 300 calls. So, for any call to stand out and be remembered, it really says something. I was working the night shift, from 6pm to 6am, and things were going as usual. There were typically about 75 people working at a time, split into dispatchers, call evaluators, and leads. I was on my four-hour call-taking stint, and the night had gone by fairly unremarkably by 911 call-taker standards. The phone would ring, I would answer, evaluate or transfer the call, then hang up. Repeat that over and over, call after call. If we didn't wear uniforms, I wouldn't even remember what I was wearing that night. But I do remember one specific call, not because it was particularly gruesome or even funny, but because it was strange, eerie. I answered the call, my eyes scanning the information as it appeared on my computer screen. It indicated it was coming from a landline at Fire Hall 23. This wasn't unusual. Fire halls often have landline phones available to the public outside them, just in case there's a walk-up emergency when the crew is out or asleep. On autopilot, I answered, 911, for what city? And I was met with silence. Again, not unusual. Pocket dials and miss dials happened all the time, so I tried again. 911, for what city? This time, I was met with what sounded like breathing slow and quiet. It was definitely breathing. Still, this wasn't unusual. We dealt with cases where callers could not speak due to fear of being found by an attacker or because of a medical emergency. So I tried one of the tactics we often employed in these situations. I can hear you. Tap the phone once for yes twice for no, once for yes, twice for no. I paused to give them a chance to understand. Are you in such and such city? Tap. They were saying yes. We were making progress. Do you need the police? Tap, tap. Okay, then I pressed on. Do you need the fire department? Tap. Tap. So yes, that meant it was my call to evaluate. The person was at a fire hall, and Engine 23 was there, so I figured this would be straightforward. I put up the call, and that's when I realized the location on my map wasn't, in fact, the location of Fire Hall 23. Or at least, it wasn't the location of Fire Hall 23 now. As cities grow and change... So do the placements of fire halls, police stations, and EMS stations. Years ago, before my time at 911, Fire Hall 23 had moved to a newly built hall in a location with better access to major roadways. The original Fire Hall 23 had been torn down. Nothing stood on the empty lot. I'm still here with you, okay? I said into the phone, aiming to reassure whoever was on the other end. I hit the mute button and I stood up to make eye contact with my lead. She came over, and I explained my situation. She looked between the data on my screen, my notes, and the map, pinpointing the call's origin to now be an empty, dirt patch where the old fire hall used to be. Opting for caution, she instructed me to send the crew from the current fire hall 23 to investigate the old location, just in case... The call was dispatched, and Engine 23 responded. I was told to keep the line open in case I heard anything else, and to continue assuring the caller that help was on the way. 
Of course, the firefighters found nothing and no one. Definitely no phone. We never did find out how the call was placed or who was able to answer me on the other line with tapping. But I think about that call often. Something in the stairwell. From Honest Bob's Used Organs. I work at a hotel casino in Oklahoma as the night shift housekeeper. Generally, I like the job. I'm by myself most of the time. It's quiet. I can go about my work with little distraction. Even my supervisor's only there for the first two hours or so of my shift. So most nights I'm either alone or sometimes the executive housekeeper, who we'll refer to as boss lady, will stay late to catch up on office work. Some of my coworkers don't like being in the hotel after hours. They say it creeps them out. That's how I got the night shift spot. None of the others wanted it. But I'm a night owl, so it worked out fine for me. Plus, I've never really had a problem walking the halls at night. After all, I'm a six-foot-tall, 37-year-old man with some martial arts background, I'll have you know. On top of that, it's a casino, so there's security everywhere. One emergency call into my radio or a press of the panic button, which I wear around my neck, and the place will be swarmed with guards in less than a minute. My only issue is the stairwells. You see, something's just not right about them. I first started noticing it about a week after I switched to the night shift. I was walking down the south stairwell to talk to the front desk when my radio suddenly started to buzz. I should note at this point that we don't actually have a second floor. Thanks to the high vaulted ceilings on the first floor, where the second floor should be is just a series of empty landings. I call it the dead zone. And it's precisely this spot where my radio started to act weird. At first, I didn't think much of it, but it was just the beginning of a long series of weird happenings in those stairwells. Usually, I'll hear footsteps behind me on the stairs, or get the odd feeling that someone or something is watching me. Occasionally, I'll feel a tug on my shirt, but there have been a couple of events that were more substantial. The first was about half a year after moving to Knights. I was cleaning some windows on the fourth floor when I heard Boss Lady's voice over the radio. B, what's your 20? She asked. Fourth floor, south end, I replied. Meet me at the front desk. So I jumped in the guest elevator and headed down. When I got there, the only one at the desk was our front desk agent. I waited around for a few minutes, but Boss Lady never showed up. I went back to the housekeeping office, and there she was at her desk. What did you need? I asked. She looked confused. Um, nothing. Didn't you just call me on the radio? Nope, wasn't me. If it had been my supervisor, I'd just write it off as a practical joke. But boss lady isn't the prankster type. Afterward, I couldn't shake off this sense of unease for the rest of the night. A few months went by and I was doing my job as normal. I went into the north stairwell to drop down a floor when I heard a loud clanging sound from below me, and then another, just like it, from above. As far as I knew, I was the only one in there. It was late, so the rest of the housekeeping staff had gone home, and security was not due to make their rounds for another hour. I know those stairwells well, and there was nothing in there that could fall and make that noise. The most recent incident happened just last week. I was mopping the north stairwell. I hate working in there. Not just due to the creepiness factor, but it's also just an unpleasant place to be. It's hot, it's cramped, so I'd put it off as long as I could. But finally, it just had to get done. I was working my way down with my mop, and when I got down to about the fifth floor, I very clearly heard a voice below me. Hey, B. I looked over the rail. There was nothing. Just empty stairs all the way down. This happened three more times that night. Every time, there was nothing there. My coworkers like to tease me for being the big tough guy who's afraid of the stairs, but I'm absolutely certain there's something in there. 
and the really unnerving part is that whatever it is, it knows my name. Strange Ride Home from Jocelyn R. When I was 19, I worked the closing shift at a fast food chain. Our time to close was 1 a.m., and we usually finished around 2.30 a.m. At that time, I lived about an hour away and had to drive through town to reach the back road where I lived. One particular night, I noticed a black car parked next to mine after the store had closed. I was the only car in the lot, since my manager and all the other crew members lived nearby and just walked. It struck me as odd for this car to be parked next to mine, so I kept a close eye on it. After a few minutes, the car left, and I assumed it might have been a customer who arrived too late. They could have been checking the store hours on their phone. Once my shift ended, I followed the usual route through town. As I drove, I spotted two men standing in the middle of the street. One of them saw my car approaching, and instead of moving, he lay down with his head on my side of the road. Naturally, I slowed down and considered asking if everything was okay. As I began to come to a stop, I noticed two more men running towards my car from both sides. In that split second, I decided to swerve past the man's head and accelerate away. Given that it was 2.30 in the morning and I was a young girl alone, this situation sent shivers down my spine. A week later, during a heavy thunderstorm, I was cleaning the dining room at work when I saw the same black car park next to mine again. This time, I stood and observed it. A man got out. He started to examine my windshield. Reacting quickly, I rushed to get my manager's help. He was a larger man with an intimidating presence. Just as he was about to step outside to confront the guy, the man hurriedly got back into his car and drove away. Considering the storm and the car's speed, my manager couldn't catch the license plate in time. During this incident, I couldn't clearly see the license plate through the window, and the car left too fast for my manager to note the number. Afterward, I went outside to check if anything had been left on my car, but there was nothing. Skipping ahead to the drive home, I began to take a different route to avoid those men in the road. The storm raged on, and to my dismay, my windshield wipers stopped working. It was late, and I had no one to call for assistance. I ended up driving home very slowly with my window down and my head outside to see. I shudder to think about what might have happened if I hadn't noticed those men rushing toward my car in time, or if I'd taken my usual route and had to stop due to my malfunctioning wipers. The Lady from Ava B. I work at a small grocery store in Canada. The store is so tiny that it only has four aisles and six employees. We're open from Monday to Saturday. The town where the store is located is quite old. I am 17 years old, and this was my second job. When I started, my boss asked if I could work on Saturday during the day. Without giving it much thought, I said yes. On Saturdays, only two people work the entire day from 9 to 6, and I was paired up with my co-worker, who lives in town. During his one-hour lunch break, he usually goes home. One Saturday, I found myself sitting in the back. Saturdays are typically slow, so I took the opportunity to sit down and eat something, since I was feeling hungry. The store doors make this loud ringing sound whenever someone enters, but no one had come in yet. Suddenly, I heard a woman laughing. That was weird, because I should have been all alone in that store. Intrigued, I went to investigate where the sound was coming from. I searched everywhere, but I didn't find anybody. Just as I was about to return to the back of the store, I heard something fall over. I checked again, and to my surprise, almost half an aisle of canned goods had fallen over on the floor. I quickly cleaned up the mess. While picking up the cans, Someone tapped my left arm, and I swear I heard a whisper, Don't be lazy in my store. Startled, I turned around, but no one was there. 
feeling unnerved, I called my mom. She was basically my only friend at the time. She suggested I turn on the radio to help me relax. I followed her advice and switched it on. A month after that, I arrived for work one day, and my coworkers were discussing the lady and how she haunts the store. They mentioned she used to be the store manager. Soon after, our new manager decided that we should start rearranging things in the store. On a Saturday, which happened to be my last solo day for lunch, I was stocking shelves. Out of nowhere, an old lady stood in front of me with a blank stare. I hadn't heard anyone enter. I politely asked, Ma'am, can I help you? She continued to stare blankly. Then suddenly, she started to scream at me while scratching at my face. Instinctively, I pushed her away. Amid her screams, she yelled, You didn't ask me before moving things around. I shouted back, I'm sorry, but you're not my manager. Her screams intensified and I closed my eyes. I heard the door open and when I looked, she had disappeared. Thankfully, I haven't experienced any more unsettling incidents lately. I hope it stays that way. Fragile Therapy from Valentina After hearing so many chilling stories, I felt it was time to share a haunting memory from my younger years. The year was 1983, a time when the vast terrain of the USSR sprawled over Eastern Europe and Northern Asia. I found myself in Karelia, a breathtaking region of Russia known for its dense forests, intricate lakes, and chilling northern winds. Karelia during the 80s was a different world. The land was as rugged as the people and the remnants of the Great War were still visible, not in buildings or streets, but in the eyes of its citizens. I worked as a nurse in a psychiatry facility, located on the outskirts of a small town. The building, though stern and imposing, was surrounded by the calm beauty of nature, an ironic setting for those whose minds were in turmoil. Here we treated a wide number of cases, from mild depressions to severe psychotic episodes, the facility had a separate wing for patients who were considered dangerous, either to themselves or to others. Life was routine, with its fair share of challenges, of course, but there was one patient in that isolated wing that everyone was cautious of, Mikhail. In his mid-thirties, Mikhail had a history of violent outbursts. Records showed he'd once been a teacher, a beloved figure in his community, before something snapped after a traumatic event that happened while he was on a school trip with his students. Two of his students were tragically lost in a sudden storm. He never forgave himself. The overwhelming guilt, combined with the grief of the town which once loved and respected him, became too much to bear. His mental health deteriorated rapidly, leading to outbursts of anger, severe depressive episodes, and eventually, his commitment to the psychiatric facility. His deep-set eyes always seemed to be studying you, calculating, as if deciding whether you were a threat or an opportunity. One evening as a winter storm raged outside, I was assigned to the isolation ward due to a shortage of staff. With a heavy sigh and a prayer, I started my rounds, eventually coming to Mikhail's room. The room was dimly lit, with a single bulb flickering overhead. As I entered, Mikhail sat on his bed, eyes fixated on a small window that overlooked the snow-covered courtyard. Not wanting to startle him, I softly called out, Mikhail, it's time for your medication. No response. As I approached, I could hear him muttering under his breath. The words weren't clear, but it was evident he was agitated. Trying to remain calm, I gently placed my hand on his shoulder. That turned out to be a big mistake. In a flash, he grabbed my wrist with one hand and my neck with the other, his grip like iron. I could feel his cold breath on my face as he whispered something incomprehensible, his eyes wide and wild. Panic surged through me, and in that moment, I realized just how vulnerable I was. I tried to speak, tried to soothe him, 
but words failed me. All I could think was, what if he decided to hurt me, or worse? What if no one heard me scream over the roaring storm outside? The seconds felt like hours, but it was probably just a minute or two before orderlies finally rushed into the room, having heard the commotion. They managed to restrain Mikhail and administer a sedative. In the meantime, I was escorted out, shaken but unharmed. Sitting in the break room, I realized that while Mikhail didn't harm me, the terror of what could have happened would stay with me. After that distressing evening, I requested not to be assigned to the isolation ward again. The head nurse granted this request, but Mikhail's unpredictable presence was always felt, his room casting a dark shadow that permeated the facility. As co-workers told me, more outbursts followed in the weeks ahead. Some time went by, and the incident started to fade from the forefront of my mind. That is, until one day, when there was a rumor in the facility. A rumor that Mikhail had crafted an intricate drawing on the walls of his room. Curiosity overcame my apprehension, so I decided to take a peek for myself. The drawing was real and bewildering. It was a detailed depiction of the facility itself, but with certain rooms highlighted, others crossed out. Right at the corner of his sketch, away from the main building, was a small depiction of a shed, a shed that was a real storage area for the hospital. It was then I remembered a rumor that during the war, the shed had been used for unauthorized, clandestine experiments on patients. So, how did Mikhail know about this? Was there a connection between his current state and that old forsaken shed? Late one evening after my shift, curiosity compelled me to venture towards that shed. The snow crunched beneath my feet, the full moon casting shadows. Pushing the door open, I was met with an unexpected sight. A makeshift classroom setup. Old wooden desks, a chalkboard, and scattered papers. In front, on the other side of the room, on a wall, I could see photos. There were pictures of patients sitting in the classroom. Right in the middle of it all was a photo. A photo of younger Mikhail, surrounded by younger patients, presumably his students. A realization struck me. This wasn't just a storage shed. At some point, it had been Mikhail's sanctuary a place where he taught and interacted with young people away from the world. But why here in the confines of the psychiatric facility? Before I could wonder further, a soft voice echoed from the doorway. A place full of memories, isn't it? I turned swiftly to see Irina, a co-worker from another ward who had been at the facility far longer than I had. She walked over, her fingers lightly touching the photo. This was Mikhail's class. He used to teach here as part of a therapy program. The facility believed that letting him connect with his past, under supervision, might help him heal. I was taken aback. Why here in this old shed? Irina sighed. It was isolated, away from the main facility. The thought was it would be less intimidating for him. But perhaps it was a mistake. Being here so close to the past, yet confined within the boundaries of the institution, it might have just made things worse. She looked around, sadness evident in her eyes. Sometimes trying to reconnect someone with their past can be a double-edged sword. For Mikhail, it seems to have cut deeper than anyone realized. With that in mind, I went home. I've never forgotten that night, and it just reminds me how fragile humans can be, and that things are not always in our hands. Take care, everyone. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, 
PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an eerie cast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com. <laughs>